The La Criminotica podcast on iVooks has experienced significant growth. This week we rose 958 positions in the global ranking and 57 in our specific category of news and events. First and foremost, I want to express my sincere thanks to all of our listeners for their warm support. I want to stress that we remain committed to exploring and presenting criminology cases that often don't get the attention they deserve on other shows. Through La Criminotica, we are illuminating these lesser-known episodes and bringing them closer to our audience. Our commitment to excellence and revealing hidden stories remains unwavering. Thank you for being part of this journey with us. From La Criminotica, we want to make a special mention and express our deepest gratitude to the countries from where we receive the greatest number of listeners. It is an honor to have such diverse and dedicated audiences. To Spain, our undisputed leader, with 8,073 listeners, thank you for being the backbone of our audience. To our neighbors in Portugal, with 30 listeners, thank you for your interest and closeness. To Mexico, with 27 listeners, thank you very much for tuning in from the other side of the Atlantic. To the United Kingdom, with 23 listeners, and Belgium, with 22, your presence makes us happy and motivates us to continue. Greetings to Colombia, Argentina, Equatorial Guinea and Ireland, with around 20 listeners each. We are delighted to have you in our community. To Uruguay, Israel, Switzerland, France, Andorra, Germany, Sweden and Chile, we are honored by your tune and we hope to continue being of your interest. Finally, to Austria, Australia and Venezuela, with eight listeners each, we thank you for giving us a chance and we hope to continue being a choice for you. To each and every one of you, thank you. We are here thanks to your support and we will continue working to bring you quality and relevant content in the field of criminology. Welcome to a new episode of La Criminotica. Today we dive into the depths of Swedish criminal history to shed light on a landmark case in the history of Swedish justice. We are moved to the cold winter of 1910, where the cobbled streets of Stockholm, the Swedish capital, were darkened by a crime that would reverberate for decades. We will focus on the life, crime, and downfall of Johan Alfred Ander, the last man to be executed in Sweden, and the only time the guillotine, that macabre French machine, was used on Swedish soil. This episode promises to be both educational and impactful, as we explore the psychology and motivation behind a desperate man, the circumstances that led him to commit a heinous murder, and the court system that ultimately decided his fate. As we reveal the details of this case, we will also reflect on the criminal practices of the time and how they have evolved since then. Without further ado, join us on this dark journey through time, to a bloody and significant chapter in Swedish history. Classification, Killer Characteristics, Robbery, he was the last prisoner to be executed in Sweden and the only execution carried out by guillotine. Number of Victims, 1. Date of Crime, January 5, 1910. Date of Arrest, May 14, 1910. Date of Birth, October 27, 1873. Victim, Victoria Hells 10, Secretary of an Exchange Agency. Method of Crime, Beating with a Roman Scale. Location, Stockholm, Sweden. Status, he was executed by guillotine in Langholmen Prison, in Stockholm, on November 23, 1910. Johann Alfred Andersen Ander, October 27, 1873 to November 23, 1910, was the last prisoner to be executed in Sweden and the only execution to be carried out by guillotine. Alfred Johann Andersen Ander The murderer thief Ander, the last to be executed in Sweden. On the evening of January 4, 1910, Johann Alfred Andersen Ander, born November 27, 1873 in V.Lagno, Justero, Stockholm County, and his wife Julia Charlotte Lander, born 1867 in Norchirping Hedvig, Ostergotland County, they took the steamer Wax home one from the Karlsud dock to Stockholm. 
Karlsud is located at the tip of the Bojsensland at near Vaxholm and the couple lived there temporarily, sharing housing with Alfred Anders' father, former Captain Johann Erik Andersen born December 28, 1844 in Osby, Ulgestero, Stockholm County, and Anders' stepmother, Maria Christina Andersen. Since the summer, the Anders had been short of money. Alfred Ander had been released from prison in Vastervik in early June and had been unemployed ever since. Except for a short period during a general strike, when he worked as a tram driver for Stockholm Sparvagar. But he was fired from that job in September. Her wife also lost her job as a waitress at the Lighting Gobro Vardshus in Jurgården when the general strike broke out in August. The couple had to leave their apartment on Tontobogatan in Vesastin, Stockholm. Afterwards, they lived briefly on Ostermalm and on Kungsholmen. But when their money ran out, they had to move in with Anders' father, Captain Andersen, in Karlsad. The weather was cloudy and cold that Wednesday when Waxholm 1 docked at Karlsad Quay bound for Stockholm. The couple boarded the ship and Ander paid for the trip with 50 or that he had borrowed from his father. The purpose of the trip to Stockholm was to try to raise money. According to Julia Charlotta, they would try to borrow from acquaintances. In addition, Alfred Ander would try to recover an old debt of more than 150 crowns from an old acquaintance. Lack of money had taken up much of the couple's time in recent months. Ander had been to Stockholm several times since they moved in with his father and stepmother. To look for a job, visit the doctor for his tuberculosis, and try to borrow, he had said. But so far he had not been successful. The stepmother was wary of Ander's abilities and she had told her husband on several occasions that she did not believe that anyone would lend Ander money. She was also worried that he would sign something that would cause them trouble. But shortly after Christmas, Ander had gone to the phone station on the island and called someone in Stockholm who, according to Ander's own words, would lend him 500 kroner. Then, Ander's father would receive a hundred crowns as payment for a loan that he had given to his son, something that he pleased Captain Anderson, who needed to buy new boots. For her part, Julia Charlotta had contacted a relative and obtained a promise of a loan. But she wouldn't be able to receive the money until after January 3rd. And she went in part to pick him up that she was now traveling to the city with her husband. When the ship arrived, after about an hour's journey, at the Gustav III monument at Skepsbron, next to Stockholm Castle, the couple parted ways. Each one would go to visit the people who could lend them money, and they would spend the night in different places. The wife would spend the night with a Mrs. Samuelson on Kungsholmen, where they had rented a room before moving to Karlsad. They agreed to meet the next day to catch the boat that would leave shortly after three in the afternoon for Karlsad. Alfred Ander went from Skepsholmen to the Temperance Hotel on Bergargaden, quite close to Stockholm Central Station. That he chose the Temperance to spend the night seemed strange. He had run away without paying the last time he stayed there in the fall of 1909 and would probably be recognized by the hotel staff. After checking in and settling in, and picking up a suitcase he'd left behind when he ran away without paying in November, Ander headed out into the city. According to him, to try to find a man who owed him money, a traveling salesman named Carl August Johansson who lived at Radmansgatten 65, not far from Ander's hotel. Johansson owed money and a lottery ticket that Ander was to collect. Whether Ander actually visited Johansson or not is anyone's guess today. No Johansson was found at that particular address. It is also not known whether this Carl August Johansson, whom Ander often spoke of, actually existed. However, Alfred Ander ran several other errands that afternoon and evening of January 4, 1910. He went to Gerald's exchange office at Montorgsgatten 2. The office was located half a floor down the street, at the rear of the Rydberg Hotel, which would later close. Next to the hotel cafe in the building that would later be demolished to make way for the Scandinavissa Bank headquarters. The exchange office was like today's Forex, 
where you could buy and sell foreign currency and other securities. The owner, widow Anna Rosalie Gerald, would later identify Ander as the man who had walked into the office that afternoon on January 4th, looked around, and then, when asked for his purpose, bought a list of sweepstakes. For five or and left. Or, is a currency unit of Sweden. Historically, there were 100 or in a Swedish crown, krona, which is the main currency of Sweden. However, due to inflation and other economic reasons, physical or coins were discontinued and they are no longer in circulation as of 2010. Although physical coins are no longer used, the term or is still used in electronic contexts, such as gas prices or when rounding up amounts on bills. At the Gerald Exchange office, half a floor down from the street near Mintergit, the cleaner Maria Lovisa Johansson had arrived at half past seven and opened the bars and then the front door. She was almost done cleaning up when a man entered the premises shortly before nine. The man had a coat and a briefcase or something similar under one arm, and his hand was in his coat pocket as if he was holding something under it. Miss Johansson told the man that the office was not open yet, that it would open at nine. The man said nothing and just walked away. Shortly before nine, cashier Anna Victoria Hells 10, known as Tora, arrived at the exchange office for work. She brought with her some sandwiches in a package, she put her bag in a corner and exchanged a few words with the cleaner. Then she made some hot chocolate for breakfast. Tora Hells 10, 24, enjoyed her work at the exchange office. She was prized by both customers and her owner, the widow Gerald. Tora had worked in the office for five years, ever since she moved to Stockholm from Sundsvall, where she grew up. She lived with her sister Signa Hers in a rented room on Dobonsgatten in Stockholm. On Epiphany Day, she left home at half past eight in the morning. According to her sister, Tora was in an especially good mood because she knew that Signa and her fiancé were planning to announce her engagement that very night. The cleaner remained on the premises until just after half past nine. Before leaving, she heard a man come in and ask Tora Hells 10 something. But Maria Lovisa Johansson was cleaning behind a screen at the time and she never saw the visitor clearly. She only saw him from behind when she left. However, she got the feeling that he was the same man who had walked into the office that morning. When Maria Lovisa Johansson left the exchange office, Tora Hells 10 was having breakfast. The electric overhead lights were on and the doors were wide open. Around a quarter to eleven in the morning, the deliverman Hugo Bernard Johnson arrived at the exchange office with a sack of coal. The door was ajar and he went in, but he didn't see anyone in the room. He yelled, hello, Cole, twice, but he got no response. Johnson initially thought the cashier was out for some reason. But then he saw her feet sticking out from behind the counter and realized that she was lying on the floor. Thinking that she had fallen ill, he went out with the sack of coal, left it in his cart, and asked his colleague to come in with him. On the floor behind the counter, they found cashier Tora Hells 10 unconscious in a pool of blood. She didn't move or make a sound. Johnson asked his colleague to call the police and stood guard until they arrived. The first officer to arrive, Johann Adolf Lindbergh, was able to quickly determine that Tora Hells 10 was still alive and breathing weakly. He also noticed that the door of the safe at the exchange office was ajar and that it was empty. Together with his colleague Emil Olas Den, Lindbergh turned Tora Hells 10, who emitted a light snore. She loosened her clothing as they both moved her body away from the large pool of blood. Lindbergh began performing CPR, pressing on her chest. Den called an ambulance and requested reinforcements from the police station. Resuscitation attempts continued until the ambulance arrived some three to four minutes later. Den and one of the paramedics lifted Tora Hells 10 onto a stretcher and removed her from it. More policemen arrived at the exchange office, and both Lindbergh and Den escorted Seraphimer Lasseretet into the ambulance. 
There, the doctors tried to get Torah to say something about what had happened to her, who had hurt her, but to no avail. She then was taken to an operating room, but she passed away before she could begin surgery. Doctors who examined her injuries determined that she had a head wound approximately three inches long with blunt edges. At the bottom of the wound, her skull was fractured along the entire length of the wound. Just to the left of that wound was another, an inch long and blunt edged, which also led to her brain. In addition, there were several bruises and scratches on her head. The Stockholm police now had a homicidal robbery to investigate. Newspapers in the capital covered the news widely. The news was already in the evening edition of Aftonbladet on Epiphany Day. Murders, after all, were quite rare in Stockholm, and homicidal robberies even more so. The owner of the exchange office, the widow Gerald, was informed of the theft by telephone. She arrived at the scene from her residence on Commandorsgaden and was able to determine that the thief had stolen both Swedish and foreign currency and securities totaling more than 5,000 riksdaler. In today's monetary value, that would equate to approximately 250,000 crowns. In addition, the two locks that were usually used to close the gates at the entrance were missing. At the Temperance Hotel on Bergargaden, staff noticed that the guest in room 35, Alfred Ander, had returned. He arrived in a horse-drawn taxi and asked the doorman, Richard Ephraim Larson, to settle the accounts, both for the last night and for the one he had avoided paying for months before. The elevator operator, David Julius Johansson, met Ander, whom he recognized from previous visits and whom he had brought to his room the day before. Ander looked noticeably stressed and pale. The chambermaid, Annie Erickson, was dispatched to collect the payment. At first, Ander didn't want to let her in, but when he finally did, she paid him in cash. He noticed bills that didn't appear to be Swedish on the table. Ander informed the staff that he would return later to collect his bag and that he planned to take the ferry to Vaxholm. On his way out, he gave Johansson a crown as a tip and said, please, then left. The so-called detective police were already at the exchange house investigating. The preliminary investigation was led by prosecutor Gustav Lidberg. The search for the murderer was in charge of this police unit, led by officer J. R. Frick. Soon clues began to arrive. That night, the doorman of the Temperance Hotel, Richard Larson, contacted the police. He told about the guest in room 35, who had acted strangely and left hastily. When Larson mentioned the suitcase that was still at the hotel, Frick and his team immediately went to investigate. They opened the suitcase right there and got a big surprise. It contained banknotes and coins, mainly foreign, other valuable documents, a bag and a wallet with the name of Torah Hells 10. There was also bloody newspaper, probably used to wipe it off her hands. That was not all. There was also a French de Beavis, a document needed at the time in order not to be arrested for vagrancy, issued in the name of Johann Alfred Anderson Ander, already known to the police. Also, there was a photo of Ander. Frick showed the image to the doorman and hotel staff, who confirmed it was him. They also said that Ander had mentioned that he would be taking the ferry to Vaxholm at 3.10 in the afternoon. On the ferry, Ander told his wife that he had managed to borrow 300 crowns. He bought her sandwiches and wine during the trip to Karlsad. Ander had also bought provisions in the city and the sled that his father brought to the pier was not enough, they had to make two trips. Then they dined in Captain Anderson's cabin. However, according to what his stepmother, Christina Anderson, later recounted, Ander, who normally ate well, was unable to eat much that night. They talked about the events in the city, and Julia Charlotta mentioned the terrible robbery and murder in Gerald's. She said that she had read about the crime in the Aftonbladet newspaper that Ander had brought from Stockholm. At the request of his father and stepmother, Ander began to read the article to them. But when he got to the part that described how the injured cashier had been taken to the hospital, 
he stopped reading and asked his stepmother to continue. Other than that, Ander didn't show any particular signs of agitation. When he got dark, the four of them went to sleep. After Officer Frick learned that Ander had probably traveled to Vaxholm, he searched the ships of Vaxholm's Belligets and asked if anyone had seen him. The helmsman of the Waxholm I, who had known Ander since childhood, was able to tell that Ander and a woman had disembarked at Karlsud from the ship that had left at 3.10 p.m. toward Vaxholm. They were met at the dock by Captain Anderson, whom the helmsman also knew. It was the night of January 5, 1910, the last Vaxholm ferry had left. Officer Frick requested the transport Bologets tug SIG, and at 10.20 p.m., two officers and eight detectives headed for Karlsud with Captain Gustafsson at the helm. With the lights off, they arrived at the Karlsud pier at 11 p.m. The police disembarked and began searching Captain Anderson's cabin. But darkness and ice made the journey difficult and it took time to find the place, even though Anderson lived only a 15-minute walk from the pier. At that time, Karlsud was mainly inhabited by large villas of timber merchants that served as summer residences for the wealthy of Stockholm. Permanent residents were few. Although today, Karlsud is an exclusive residential area inhabited by celebrities such as Borg Saming and Ingemar Stenmark. First, after persuading a local resident to lead the way in exchange for compensation of five crowns, they found the right place. The police surrounded the house and Senior Sergeant Frick pounded on the door. Ander's father answered. The police broke into the house. Ander was arrested rather dramatically. He was still in bed with his wife when the police rushed in. A loaded rifle was propped against the wall in the room. But Ander didn't get to the gun before being surprised. Money, lottery tickets, some padlocks and other objects that came from the robbery at the Gerald's Exchange House were found in the house. Less than 24 hours after the murder, the murderer Alfred Ander was arrested. Alfred Ander, after his confirmation at Vaxholm at the age of 14, worked as an apprentice in restaurants. Among others, he worked at the Stromsborg, Hamburger Boers and Mosbach restaurants. In 1890, he bought a cigar shop on Last McCargadon in Stockholm. For a year, it was run by his fiancée, and later his wife, Julia Charlotta Lander. After military service at Vaxholm from 1893 to 1894, Ander continued to work as a waiter. He and his wife ran the Jarnvag Chotelet in Strangness at the end of 1898. Ander started the business with a bang, throwing parties to which the city's leading personalities were invited. Parties where the champagne flowed and which were mentioned, among others, in the culinary magazine Ganymedon. Along with a few other people from the town, according to the Eskilstunakuren newspaper, Ander tried to obtain the liquor rights for Strangness. But it was not successful. A short time later, a fire broke out in the Jarnbag Chotelet. Most of the hotel burned down and the owner, from whom Ander leased the restaurant, received more than 4,000 kroner as fire insurance compensation. Police were able to determine that the fire had been arson. Kerosene was used to start the fire. Ander was questioned, but without conclusive results. A short time later, the business was declared bankrupt and the Anders left Strangness. They moved back to Stockholm. Their Ander was arrested for the theft of a bicycle in May 1900. He was sentenced to three months in prison on Langholmen and was released in August. He then moved to Helsinki and began working as a waiter at Societetsjuset. His wife also moved to Finland later. In 1902, they rented the Svensk Sund restaurant in Kotka. Ander's savings were enough to renew and start the business, which according to Anders' statements during police questioning, was profitable. But when the license to sell alcohol was revoked in 1903, the couple closed the restaurant. In 1904, they took over the Continental Hotel in Hanko, which went bankrupt after half a year. His wife then tried to set up a carriage hire business, but that too failed. 
Both Ander and his wife were heavy drinkers during their time in Finland. Julia Charlotta revealed during police interrogations that Ander had mistreated her on several occasions while they were living in Henko. While they were residing in Kotka, Ander acquired a revolver and one night, being very drunk, he shot around his bedroom. Julia Charlotta was forced to flee the room. When she returned later, she found Ander sitting in an armchair with the barrel of the revolver in his mouth, threatening to take his life. In the spring of 1906, the couple decided to return to Sweden. They took over the Rumforsa hostel in Ostergotland. That business also went bankrupt in less than half a year. Alfred Ander then decided to embark on a new company. He had plans to start a sawmill in Norrköping. He rented a three-room apartment in the city and ordered a train carriage to transport his and his wife's belongings from Rumforsa. However, no carriage was available when it was time for the move, leading to an altercation in which Ander assaulted the station inspector, Sablestrom. Ander was arrested and sentenced to prison again. But he managed to escape during the transfer to the prison in Linköping and fled to Stockholm, where he stole a coat at the central station. He then sailed to Finland, where he committed another robbery. Later that same year, the court in Helsinki sentenced Alfred Ander to nine months in prison and three years probation. He was extradited to Sweden and sentenced by the Kinda Court in May 1908 to one year, two months, and four days in prison. Ander appealed the sentence to the Gata Court of Appeal, but the sentence was upheld and he served his sentence in Vastervik prison. It was after midnight on January 6, 1910 when the Anders, both handcuffed, together with Anders' father and his stepmother, were taken aboard the SIG, which was returning to Stockholm. At 3.15 in the morning, the ship docked at Skepsbron Wharf. The four detainees were escorted by police officers to the detective's office at Minkaden 4 in Stockholm. Suspicions about the involvement of Anders' father and his stepmother in the robbery homicide were soon dispelled. They obviously knew nothing about the couple's activities in Stockholm. On Saturday they were able to return home to Karlsad. However, the wife Julia Charlotta was detained for several more days. Although the police were able to quickly determine that she was not present when the crime was committed, they suspected that she knew Ander had planned the robbery. According to Aftonbladet sources, Julia Charlotta had acted very nervously during the journey with Waxholm I back from Stockholm. Both she and Ander had traveled there several times before, but rarely had the money to sit in the drawing room and eat and drink. Ander had ordered port for his wife, the best the ship had to offer. Only after Julia Charlotta had had a few drinks did she relax and allow herself to be coaxed into ordering a sandwich. However, there was no evidence against Julia Charlotta Ander and she was released from police custody on the night of Sunday, January 9. On the other hand, the evidence against her husband was numerous. Several witnesses were able to identify Alfred Ander. At around 3 in the afternoon on Epiphany Day, he had been seen outside the exchange office by a man who knew him well. Two witnesses were also able to testify that they had spoken to Ander at around 6 p.m. the same day, while he was looking through the window of the exchange office. The office owner, the widow Gerald, also recognized Ander as the man who had visited the office on the afternoon of Epiphany Day and bought a lottery ticket. Additionally, several hotel staff members were called as witnesses to describe what they had seen on January 4th and 5th. Three days after Ander's arrest, a janitor from a building on Drottningaden, a few blocks from the exchange office, came to the police station with a found sweeping stick. It had been discovered on a flight of stairs around 11 o'clock in the morning on Epiphany Day. A hair was found on the sweeping pole that a medical examiner judged to match the hair of the murdered Torah Hells 10. This proved to the police that the killer had used the sweeping stick as a weapon when Victoria Hells 10 was killed during the robbery. Around the broom handle someone had wrapped a handkerchief that turned out to belong to the architect Johann Arvid Schockvist a neighbor of Anders' father's in Karlsad. 
Schockvist had purchased the scarf in Berlin and later personalized it with a monogram of his own design. Police were later able to determine that Ander had bought the broom at a hardware store in Stockholm in late 1909. They were also able to prove that Ander had left the paper-wrapped broom for storage at the Tistamari Café in Stockholm a few days before Christmas. Of 1909. Then he had come back and picked up the broom on the eve of Epiphany Day. A few weeks after the robbery and murder, the police also obtained a postcard that Ander had written to a woman he knew in Helsingo, Helsingfors. The postcard was sent in Stockholm on Epiphany Day and Ander had written, Today I am in Stockholm to do important business. Tomorrow everything will be decided and so it will be. During interrogations, Ander was initially unable to explain why he had written what he wrote and what he meant by it. He later reversed himself and said that he had written to the woman about a planned divorce from his wife. However, no evidence to support the claim of a planned divorce emerged, either during cross-examination or during the trial. During interrogations, Ander tried to prove that he had an alibi for the time of the robbery and murder. He gave conflicting explanations about his dealings with, according to Ander, former waiter and later street vendor Carl August Johansson, whom police have never been able to locate. He also claimed that a person unknown to him had asked him to take charge of what later turned out to be stolen goods from the exchange office. He never admitted it. When police investigators confronted him with a lie, he replied, it doesn't matter if I lie. Why Ander chose to rob Gerald's exchange office is a question that was not addressed during the police investigation. No more than the fact that the Anders were strapped for cash and all their business ventures up to that point had failed. The fate of the murdered cashier, Victoria, Tora, Hells 10, deeply shocked the inhabitants of Stockholm. Many onlookers had gathered outside the Karolinska Institute's morgue, where the white coffin with Tora's remains was on display, surrounded by numerous wreaths and flowers. Aftonbladet reported on January 11 how the body had been prepared for display. She was, wrapped in a very beautiful shroud, her head was crowned with a myrtle wreath and from this hung a white veil, trimmed here and there with myrtle and red roses, the Aftonbladet reporter wrote. The funeral procession from the Karolinska Institute on Kungsholmen to the Northern Cemetery in Solna was packed with onlookers and additional trams had to be put on the line to Haga for everyone who wanted to attend the funeral. The trial began in late February, and the prosecutor sought the death penalty in his closing argument. The verdict was delivered on May 14. With overwhelming evidence including around 100 witnesses, Johann Alfred Andersen Ander was sentenced to death for the murder of Victoria Hells 10 and for the third robbery. Ander, according to contemporary newspaper reports, took the sentence calmly and without changing his expression. Despite this, Ander appealed the sentence in all instances. Together with his father, as a last resort, he wrote a request for clemency to the majestic king, Gustav V. However, on October 28, 1910, the king rejected his request for clemency and the death sentence was confirmed. The day of the execution was set for November 23. But the date was kept secret by the authorities, who did not want to risk a rush of onlookers on Langholmen. There was no confession to the robbery homicide before the execution either. After Anders' special request, he was informed on the night of Tuesday, November 22, that he would be executed the following morning. The Stockholm executioner, Gustav Dalman, had been summoned earlier that morning by Deputy Governor Hintze, who informed him that Anders' execution would take place the following morning, Wednesday, November 23, and asked him to prepare the guillotine. The prison priest, Kayla Bernberg, was with the death row prisoner for several hours that night and also early in the morning before the execution took place. In an interview with Aftonbladet on November 23, 1910, the priest related that Ander had a complete materialistic view of life and did not believe in an afterlife. And since he had nothing to look forward to but forced labor for life if he avoided execution, the death penalty was more of a relief. 
Kayla Bernberg also pointed out that Ander had not confessed to his crime. He appreciated all the kindness I showed him, his eyes filled with big tears and his voice choked. He extended his hand to me in farewell. I took it in silence, deeply moved, said Pastor Ernberg, who, according to the Aftonbladet reporter, was noticeably affected by the event. At dawn on Wednesday, November 23, the police blocked the approaches to Langholman from the mainland. The competent authorities wanted to avoid a public spectacle. The executions aroused great interest among the public, despite the fact that since 1877 they were no longer public, but took place in private, behind prison walls. However, the rumor spread quickly and soon, the shoreline of Soder Malerstrand was lined with onlookers. Shortly before 8 in the morning, Ander was taken to the place of execution in the courtyard of Langholman Central Prison. Gustav Dalman and his three assistants, who were his sons, were waiting for him there, the oldest was 30 years old and the youngest only 17 years old, next to the 15-foot tall guillotine that had been purchased from France for years earlier. It had been purchased as early as 1903, but was held at customs for several years, as the customs administration did not know how to classify it. The executioner Dalman had practiced with the guillotine using pigs. Now, it would be used on a person for the first time. Also waiting in the courtyard were the twelve official invited witnesses, the notary of the governor's office, Anton Bolt, the member of the magistrate, the councillor Christian Sorensen, the prison directors, Major Axel Vallin and District Judge Ernst Orstadius, the prison chaplain, Kayla Bernberg, the municipal prosecutor, Carl Gustav Lidberg. The lawyer for the convicted person, Leonard Blom, Dr. Robert Brandel, Professors Hammer, Holtkrantz, and Holmgren, and Dr. Ludwig Ongfist. Alfred Ander greeted the assembled witnesses with a, good morning, gentlemen, according to Aftonbladet, to which those present responded by raising their hats. At 8 o'clock the sentence was read, and Alfred Ander, strengthened by a jug of wine, was led to the guillotine. His hands were tied behind his back, and his legs were also lightly tied. But, at his request, a blindfold was not placed on him. A moment before being placed on the board that was used to move the condemned man towards the guillotine blade, Ander asked the executioner's assistants to say something. However, he was not allowed. So, if at that moment he had thought of confessing or reaffirming his innocence, the world will never know. A few seconds later, the executioner Gustav Dahlman activated the guillotine mechanism. The blade fell and at 8.06, Alfred Ander was dead. His body, together with his decapitated head, was placed in the box prepared for that purpose next to the guillotine. Soon after, the body was examined at the prison's medical department by the professors and doctors present, without finding any abnormalities in Ander's brain. However, it was determined that he had suffered from advanced tuberculosis and that he had, at most, a few years to live. Alfred Ander's widow, Julia Charlotta, remained in Stockholm. She titled herself a restaurateur's widow and she initially lived in the newly established working-class suburb of Espudden, in the parish of Brankirka. In 1916, she moved to Katerina's parish in Sodermom and supplemented her income by renting rooms. Julia Charlotta, described in Aftonbladet in January 1910 as a distinguished and elegant woman, never remarried. She passed away on November 22, 1941, at the age of 77. In the dark pages of Swedish criminal history, the case of Alfred Ander stands out not only for the brutal murder he committed, but also for the grim honor of being the last man to be executed by guillotine in the country. His murder and subsequent trial of him captured the public's attention, highlighting the morbidly perpetual fascination society has with such heinous acts. Although Ander never confessed to the crime and took his version to the last consequences, the evidence accumulated against him was compelling. His tragic end in the guillotine, a machine that, curiously, Sweden had imported and that was trapped in customs for years because they did not know how to classify it, 
served as a macabre spectacle for those who, even behind the prison walls, expected to witness the event. This case also sheds light on the evolution of the criminal justice system and the public perception of the death penalty. Ander died at a time when Sweden was in the midst of a deep debate on the abolition of capital punishment, which would finally come to fruition years later. Furthermore, the subsequent story of Julia Charlotta, Ander's wife, reminds us that behind every crime there are lives that are irrevocably affected. Despite her circumstances, she continued her life with dignity, facing the shadows of her husband's past. Alfred Ander, by his act and his ultimate fate, was etched in history as a symbol of the end of an era in Swedish justice. His execution marked the end of the death penalty in the country and left a lasting legacy in discussions about the morality and efficacy of such punishment. Dear listeners, as we enter this second half of August 2023, we sincerely hope that you are enjoying every moment, surrounded by those you love most, be they family or friends. Life offers us opportunities to share, reflect and love, and we hope these days are filled with joy and connection with those who make each day special. Thank you for joining us once again in La Criminotica. Take care and until the next episode. See you soon.